Melanoma epidemic, how and why it is not. I have no conflicts to, de to declare regarding this topic. Um, my disclaimer is that I am not an epidemiologist, nor am I a clinician, and it is not my intent to tell anyone how to practice medicine. My intent is only to tell the truth as I know it about the situation from the somewhat unique perspective of being someone at the very end of the screening operation, if you will, as someone who renders diagnoses on lots and lots of melanocytic lesions. So you may have heard about the melanoma quote unquote epidemic. You can read about it in the New York Times. You can read about it in Glamour Magazine uh, where uh, you can read about the scary trend. Melanoma rates just keep climbing. Or you can turn to one of the many articles in the medical literature on this topic or that addresses it. Uh, just one example that's close to home comes from the uh, Connecticut Tumor Registry published in 2013 uh, where they note that uh, between 1950 and 2007, the overall incidence rates for melanoma rose more than 17-fold in men and more than 9-fold in women. But our best data, of course, comes from the NCI. And on their website, you can see this very striking graph where between 1975 and 2013, which is the last year the NCI has data for us on melanoma, uh, this very striking rise in the incidence of melanoma and the incidence of cutaneous melanoma is rising faster than any other major malignancy in the U.S. So enough about the epidemic. On to why maybe it's not. And the best article that addresses this topic, in my opinion, comes from uh, Gil Welsh and colleagues at Dartmouth. Uh, Welsh is a uh, respected epidemiologist and an internist. And he published this article some time ago now in the BMJ 2005 using SEER data. Um, and it's, um, in my opinion, the most important article on this topic because, number one, it is the only controlled study on this topic. It controls for screening, as we'll see, by a biopsy rate. And it's important because it's a large study. In this study, um, there are two graphs, two figures that tell pretty much the whole story. And we'll look closely at each of those. Firstly, figure one, x-axis is timeline 1986 to 2001, the y-axis the incidence of melanoma. At the bottom we see mortality and late stage incidence which were not statistically unchanged, were not statistically changed during this 15 year time period. However, the early stage incidence and total incidence of melanoma strikingly went up 2.4 times in this 15 year period. Now, there's a problem in that discrepancy between incidence and morbidity and mortality, first pointed out very strongly by Dr. Robert Swerlick and colleagues in a landmark uh, article in the Archives of Dermatology, where they noted that, yes, the diagnosis of melanoma is up dramatically, but most are thin lesions. There's no marked increase in thick lesions or fatalities. So are we doing a great job in removing melanomas early before they can spread? Or alternatively, maybe are we over-diagnosing melanoma? And here clarification in terms is necessary. Over-diagnosis is not misdiagnosis. Over-diagnosis is the diagnosis of disease that will never cause symptoms and never cause death. Swerlich brought up the important point, which is still true, that only a small minority of Americans are actually screened for melanoma, be it by their dermatologist, general practitioner, or in a screening clinic. And he argued that if the epidemic were true, more unaware unscreened patients would be presenting with thick and or fatal melanomas. By contrast, back then, the epidemic seemed to be occurring wherever intense screening occurred. And the evidence was anecdotal, but now we have hard data. And this is figure two from Welch. The x-axis is now the rate of skin biopsy per 100,000 population, and it serves as a good control of screening. The y-axis is, again, the apparent incidence of, of melanoma. Each dot represents one year's worth of data from one of the then nine SEER regions of the United States. So each dot has tens of thousands of years of patient data. And as you can see, we have a strong and direct correlation. Wherever there is gr greater screening as measured by increased biopsy rate, we have a greater apparent incidence of melanoma. Biopsy rate went up 2.5 times during this 15-year time period. 
the apparent incidence of melanoma 2.4 times in this population. So how do we explain this discrepancy between incidence and morbidity and mortality? Because in an epidemic of malignancy, and we've seen at least one terrible one in our lifetimes, uh, that of lung cancer, mortality is expected to go up along with incidence. But there is one explanation by which the data that Welsh presented still could represent a true epidemic. And that would be if treatment improved, zeroing out the morbidity and mortality. It would not have to only improve, but improve slowly and gradually, zeroing out the effects of the epidemic. And of course, statistically, that would be unlikely. And most of us in this room know that it's much more than unlikely, it's impossible, because there was no improvement in melanoma therapy between 1986 and 2001. Therefore, the authors conclude their words. The predominant explanation for the apparent rise in melanoma incidence is overdiagnosis, the result of increased diagnostic scrutiny and not an increase in incidence of disease. So the, the good epidemiologists can tell us that you know there doesn't really seem to be an epidemic. But what they can't tell us and what they don't fully understand is how and why this has occurred and still seems to be continuing to occur. And so that's what I would like to address. Firstly, three factors that likely contribute to this appearance of a false epidemic of melanoma. Factor one, we'll call lesion size relative to criteria. Back in the 1930s, when histologic criteria were developed for melanoma, most lesions were thick and fatal. So they were a good correlate for histopathology. But what is the gold standard for thin lesions? Are we applying the same criteria possibly to a different set of lesions? I was discussing this topic some years ago with our esteemed colleague, Jean Bologna from Dermatology. And she said, oh yeah, this is the LPLK problem. By way of background, LPLK is lichen planus like keratosis. It is a small, benign, and insignificant lesion. And so Jean said, so why did we never see diagnosis of lichen planus like keratosis back in the day, decades ago on pathology reports. And I said, Gene, I, I don't know, I wasn't practicing then, please tell me. She said, well, it's because back in the day, we rarely biopsied anything smaller than a dime. Here's the diameter and surface area of a dime, uh, the diameter of an aspirin and a baby aspirin, which are much more the size uh, of lesions that we're seeing sampled today, some even smaller than that. Uh, these are 8% and 20% of the surface area of a dime. So, factor one, lesion size relative to criteria. Factor two, we can call for now fear of error. And I'll start off with the first commandment of dermatopathology. Thou shalt not miss a melanoma. <laughs> Why? Because gram for gram, melanoma is arguably the most malignant neoplasm in man. This lesion the size of a pea is more than likely to kill this patient. A lesion of similar size in a variety of the organ systems, if it's removed, is usually cured. And so we have a tremendous incentive not to miss this terrible disease. And so one could argue that, well, it would be reasonable to lower one's threshold so as not to miss it. But when one increases one's sensitivity for a diagnosis, unless there is some control, which there is not in histopathology, you lose specificity. And we need to take into account medical legal factors. Dr. David Troxell, every three or four years, reviews um, malpractice claims for the American Journal of Surgical Pathology. And in every one of his reviews, melanoma is one of the top two, despite the fact that melanoma is a much rarer disease than the other diseases on the list. So under diagnoses of melanoma are severely punished by shame, guilt, and usually lawsuit. But for overdiagnosis, which never really ever hardly gets changed, there is no corresponding penalty. So um, factor two, instead of calling it fear of error, I think maybe we could better term it no mismotivation. Factor three, I think, is the most important factor involved, and it's the most complicated one. It involves the concept of reservoir of pseudo-malignant disease. And to understand this concept and how it applies, I think it's useful to look at screening of some other organ systems. 
we'll look at cervix, colon, and prostate. Colon cancer screening should begin at age 50 and has contributed, at least in part, to a significant decline of about 3% annually in both incidence and mortality from colon cancer, a tremendous screening success story. The cervix, similar steady decline in both incidence and mortality from cervical cancer, another tremendous screening success story. Now let's look at an organ that's quite different to screen, the prostate. Generally starts with elevated PSA, followed by needle biopsies, typically many needle biopsies. But perhaps what we should have known before launching into this some years ago was how often histologic prostate cancer is present. SQ et al. has demonstrated that six biopsies in the setting of elevated PSA gives you a positivity rate generally of about 20 to 25 percent. This goes up to 40 percent with 13 biopsies and increases thereafter, and they conclude that the likelihood of identifying prostate cancer rises in direct proportion to how often and how thoroughly the prostate is sampled. And that may sound fine to you, uh, but um, more disturbing data comes from Soccer et al., Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, 525 men who died in accidents and none who had a history of prostate cancer. Of those who died in their 20s, 10% histologically had prostate cancer. Rising each decade, those who died in their 70s had a greater than 80% incidence of what looked like prostate cancer under the microscope, despite the fact that only 3% of men die of prostate cancer. And what this is is a huge reservoir of pseudomalignant disease disease that looks malignant under the microscope but does not behave as such. What are the consequences of screening in the setting of a large pseudomalignancy reservoir? The data around the periphery comes from the NCI website. Uh, 1,000 men screened 10 years with PSA. 110 get a diagnosis of prostate cancer. At least 50 have treatment complications which can include impotence and incontinence. Despite being screened, Four to five men, nonetheless, die from prostate cancer. <coughs> Zero to one death from prostate cancer is avoided. As a result of statistics like this, the, the uh, NCI, which as you know is very pro-cancer screening, now has on their website the following statement. Some advisor groups now recommend against the use of PSA to screen for prostate cancer because the benefits of any are small and the harms can be substantial. So the question I'd like to pose now is why is screening so good for the cervix and for the colon and so for, poor for the prostate? For the colon, um, there are at least two prominent reasons why it works very well. First of all, there is a very strong dysplasia to carcinoma progression. If the adenomas are removed, we can prevent them from becoming cancer. Secondly, and importantly, there is no significant reservoir of pseudomalignant disease. There is no common disease of the colon that looks under the microscope like colon cancer, but which is not. Similarly, in the cervix, strong dysplasia to carcinoma progression and no, com no prominent reservoir, no common lesion of the cervix that looks like <coughs> squamous cell carcinoma, but which is not. By contrast, as we saw with the prostate, we have a huge reservoir of apparent pseudomalignant disease. So now let's turn our attention to the skin. It seems like the skin should be the easiest organ to screen. For patients, all they have to do is make an appointment and show up. For us, all we have to do is look carefully at their skin and make decisions, sometimes difficult ones, about what, if anything, to sample. But there are some problems specific to screening for melanoma. Firstly, nodular melanoma, though rare, comprises a significant percentage of fatal melanoma and it tends to elude early detection because of rapid growth and frequent amelanosis. Secondly, a lesion that can look like melanoma is not only common, but is arguably the commonest neoplasm in man. Nevi can look like melanomas, certainly clinically, but also histopathologically sometimes. There are many articles in the literature that address this topic. We'll look only at one. Evan Farmer et al., 37 cases of melanoma or mimic of melanoma seen by a panel of eight true melanocytic histopathology experts, each rendering independently a diagnosis of benign, malignant, or indeterminate. These experts came to complete agreement on only 35% of cases, and the largest category had two or more discrepant diagnoses. And it may be 
that melanoma harbors something in common with its neural crest relative, pheochromocytoma. Those of you who are not pathologists may not know, you can't look at a pheochromocytoma under the microscope and decide if it's benign or malignant or make any reasonable pr prediction regarding its behavior. Fortunately for melanocytic lesions, that is much, much, much less common. And I would suggest that of randomly selected melanocytic lesions, true experts would disagree on a very small number, <clears throat> perhaps a percent. But even this number, since melanocytic lesions are so common, is not small. But of course, most diagnoses of melanoma are not rendered by melanocytic histopathology experts, but by general pathologists, dermatologists reading their own slides, or dermatopathologists who don't have particular expertise in melanoma. And the difference between that group and the expert group is even more significant, and I don't know what that figure is, but um, a significant figure indeed. And there is some peripheral tangential support for this in the literature. Uh, this study from the UK, 195 randomly selected pathologists reviewing 20 melanocytic cases. The randomly selected participants were twice as likely as the expert panel to diagnose melanoma. And this is, in fact, what we see. Those who are novice in the diagnosis of melanoma are much more likely to be malignant. So in summary on this segment, screening works great for the cervix and colon, in large part because of strong carcinoma, dysplasia to carcinoma progression, and small reservoir of pseudomalignant disease. By contrast with the prostate, we don't have at least such a strong dysplasia to carcinoma progression, and we have a large reservoir of pseudomalignant disease. Unfortunately. Melanoma looks much more like prostate cancer on screening than cervix or colon. And I don't mean to imply that overdiagnosis is limited to the skin or the skin in the prostate. We're hearing it happens to some degree in every organ, and we're hearing much more about it, particularly these days in uh, breast screening. Next question I pose is what might this reservoir of pseudomalignant disease consist of? And I suggest that there are three categories. Firstly, there are no doubt are lesions that all, even all experts would call melanoma, but never behave aggressively. <clears throat> this is true overdiagnosis and exactly the situation we have in prostate cancer. Category two, there are lesions with debatable diagnosis. We know from studies like Farmer uh, et al. that some lesions are debatable. No doubt some, probably most, are called malignant. Some of them are in fact benign. And so with this, I think we can say this is not our fault. This is just the state of histopathologic diagnosis as it stands. But I think if we're honest, those of us who work closely in this field have to admit that there's a third category, and that is lesions being called melanoma that should not be called melanoma under any circumstances that no true expert would call a melanoma. And those of us working here at Yale, where we are a melanoma referral and treatment center, and at similar centers around the country, are finding um, that we're seeing the <coughs> pendulum swinging from overcalling or missing melanoma to overcalling this disease. And there is at least a little bit of tangential peripheral support for this in the literature. Uh, this study from the Harvard Derm Path Group uh, looked at 29 cases of dysplastic nevi with severe atypia <coughs> and 11 cases of thin radial growth phase melanoma diagnosed between 88 and 90. So to start out with, 11 or 40 cases were called melanoma 20 years ago. We looked at them 20 years later and decided that now they would actually call 18 of them of the 40 melanoma. And they conclude that there's a trend toward reclassification of prior non-malignant <coughs> diagnoses of severely atypical dysplastic nevi as melanoma, and this is in fact exactly what we're seeing at our medical center. Now, um, despite the arguments that I have made, um, there are uh, those who have heard them and still strongly believe that there is a true epidemic of melanoma. And so I will try to present some of their counter arguments. Some of this comes from the most recent World Congress of Dermatology that occurred in Vancouver in 2015, uh, where I debated this topic with Dr. Daryl Regal from NYU, who is arguably the world's mo um, foremost authority on the melanoma epidemic being a true and real phenomenon. And their strongest argument is this statement, and it is a true statement. There is a true increase in the United States every year in the number of deaths from melanoma, particularly in the elderly and especially in men. But to understand this, we need to put it in epidemiologic context. Our population has been growing 
significantly and continues to do so. And as you know, the largest growing sector of that population is 65 and older. Life expectancy is increasing for men and for women. You'll note the slope is steeper for men. We're not living as long as women yet, but we're making greater strides toward longevity each year. The same phenomena is seen in Great Britain, uh, where they postulate that perhaps in the year 2030, life expectancy will be the same for men and women. Who dies of melanoma? The NCI tells us that the most common decade of death is 75 to 84. So to understand this true concept, uh, st statement, put it in context, we need two things. We need the age-adjusted death rate for melanoma, which we'll come back to, and we need a large data set. That large data set is the SEER data set, now comprising about 28% of the US population. And the NCI provides us with the age-adjusted death rate for each major malignancy. And what this statistic does is allows us to compare the effects of a particular malignancy from year to year, controlling for the size of the population and demographic shifts of that population. Now, in 1989, the age-adjusted death rate for melanoma was 2.7 per 100,000. And when I remove the gray box in a minute, we'll see the next 24 years, and this comprises at least a half a billion uh, years of data. And so, the uh, age-adjusted death rate for melanoma in 2013 was 2.7 per 100,000. It has some years been 2.6 and some years been 2.8, but it really hasn't budged at all. Um, what I would argue is this um, data suggests that not only is there not an epidemic of melanoma, but I think it actually suggests that melanoma is in fact a stable disease. The next question I'd like to pose is what specific lesions on people or that we see under the microscope are contributing to this big problem where we seem to have an epidemic? And to make a long story short, since we don't have a lot of time, it is almost certainly the biggest contributor is so-called Clark's or dysplastic nevi. For those of you who don't work in dermatology, this is just a type of nevus. It is a broad, flat lesion that you see in the trunk, scalp, and proximal extremities. They tend to grow in that broad, flat manner. The word dysplasia is a misnomer. It is not dysplasia in the sense of uh, progression like we have in the cervix or colon. It is simply what has been termed histologically dysplasia. So um, while uh, Wallace Clark described these lesions and people who don't like the, the uh, term dysplastic say, let's call them Clark's nevi. And um, the fact that this contributes may be supported a bit by the study we just looked at from the Harvard group. And the actual work that I do in this area, um, I don't have time to, to go into, um, nor would it be of interest to a non-pathology or derm audience, but it does involve in identifying lesions that can look like melanoma under the microscope, but which are not. Um, the major contributor we see is Clark's or dysplastic nevi that have fibrosis in them, which are um, very routinely called melanoma. Uh, we see lots of people refer to our medical center with fibrotic Clark's nevi called melanoma. Uh, another a contributor is melanocytic nevi that have the broad, flat architecture of a Clark's or dysplastic nevus, but cytologic features of a Spitz nevus. And both of these lesions, um, when they are miscalled as melanoma, they're thin, and so they'd be called thin melanomas. And once it could suggest that it uh, corresponds with the data we're seeing on this graph. So in conclusion, is there an epidemic of melanoma? To my mind, certainly there is not, not even, even anything close. So that's good news, right? Well, at least it's not terrible news. I mean, how scary would it be if we were having a true epidemic of melanoma like we saw with lung cancer. But what's the bad news? Is there bad news? We know the bad news in screening in the pseudo-malignancy rich environment of the prostate is, can be very bad news indeed. But how about the skin? Well, you could say it's just, you just cut it out. It's just scarring. It's not a big deal. And you could make that statement, but I think that scarring is the least of it. The rest of it is hidden. In fact, you never even know about it unless you happen to know of the very rare individual who had something called melanoma and then had it overturned and, and, not, and called, no, it wasn't melanoma. Um, or if you happen to have heard of the only media story that I'm aware of that addressed this, um, in the morning of 
May 3rd, 2007, I happened to be driving to work, I was driving through Westville, and heard this shocking story by, by Patty Naiman addressing what I do for a living every day. And her story chronicled um, the uh, story of patient Chris Euchre, this is her. Um, when she was diagnosed with melanoma, she was 33 years old, and she was mother of only one of these two children at that time. The story chronicled her anxiety, her difficulty sleeping, and she was told by her doctor to have no more children since she had a melanoma. And her words, I think, sum it up better than I ever could. All the dreams I had built of having more than one child suddenly seemed impossible. Then on top of that was this fear that I now have this wonderful little girl and I'm probably going to die and she's going to be alone. So there's a rare happy ending in this story where her dermatologist, after removing many, many dysplastic nemi, said, you know, maybe we should have your melanoma specimen sent to a true expert, see, make sure it's really melanoma. They sent it to a true expert who said, no, it's not a melanoma, it was never a melanoma. Chris Euchre went on to have a second child and I'm hope, hopeful a happy life. And so in summary, um, regarding how the, uh, and why the melanoma epidemic is not, I think that these three factors play uh, the major role. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, that was a really great presentation. Um, the people like Dr. Regal, who's, who are actually dermatologists more than pathologists, have a different view, and some of it has to do that a lot of us spent time in the sun without sunblock when we were right. kids. So would, what's your answer to those kind of data? Um, I can tell you what I do. I stay out of the sun and I wear sunblock. Um, but I don't think it probably has uh, um, that there's any big thing going on epidemiologically with melanoma and all that. It's certainly wonderful in preventing basal and squamous cell carcinomas and probably has some anti-melanoma effect too. Um, so I, I certainly agree with primary and I don't disagree with secondary screening for melanoma. I just don't think that it's, it has resulted in the epidemiologic changes that have been described. Earl, a question. Given all the intense screening going on and the scrutiny and the early biopsies, why hasn't it impacted the actual death-adjusted rate of the, the real melanoma, say the so, natural so why melanoma? Hasn't it, why hasn't it gone down? You would have thought it had some impact on yeah, that. I mean, it hasn't it, had any. It, it's, it's difficult to, you know, especially with me not being an epidemiologist, with, uh, to, to make comments about how it's related to um, uh, the um, overall you know, mortality from melanoma. I guess what I would say is that um, our screening procedures haven't really done much, that much one way or the other, or maybe it's done a little bit in both. We, we've prevented some melanomas, uh, and maybe there's a little bit of increase in incidence that's balancing that out, but um, I'm probably not qualified to make any definitive statement about that. Anything else? So I don't uh, specifically work in the area of melanoma, but I, I see genetic analyses of a fair number of them. And I suppose this question might be better posed to the melanoma researchers here. Um, what, is the, what is the analysis of some of these reservoir lesions show genetically, like all the nevi? I know that they often have some mutations, but has anybody compared the number and types of mutations between well, early melanomas and nevi? It's a difficult question, Jeff, because some of the stuff that's in the reservoir is controversial about what it actually is, so you're having a gold standard. And certainly we do see, um, and you probably know, and certainly there are many in this audience who know better than I, in so-called dysplastic nevi, in Spitz nevi, in other uh, odd things, you can see um, a variety of genetic abnormalities. Right now, you know, if you have something uh, that's like you know, CGH with a lot of change in copy numbers, it's almost certainly melanoma. But so far, everything else sort of in between that, that we're using, nothing really um, has been terribly effective yet. I mean, the good news of the story is that eventually we will have an answer and be able to more accurately diagnose melanoma. We're just not there yet, is my understanding. Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Glusak, for giving you know, a provocative and, and
our second speaker is also from the department of pathology he's sad he's sad he's sad he's sad